as a, uh, a deep sea uh, biologist, I'm really interested in the microbes that live in the deep ocean, and in particular the role they play in running our planet. And uh, science is by uh, nature this sort of slow iterative process. And, and when we're lucky, we have these moments of beautiful serendipitous discovery. And that's some of what I wanted to share with you in the next few minutes today. Okay, so humankind has always had a long relationship with the ocean, right? Some of the greatest civilizations on Earth arose near the oceans. The oceans provide us with a tremendous amount of our food. They modulate our climate. And it's, an, it's always been an integral part of, of, of uh, human evolution, human society, the evolution of human societies. Um, but, you know, and it shouldn't be a surprise. I mean, the oceans cover, uh, you know, a, a, a large part of our planet. Uh, they are... Um, an important uh, part of our global ecosystem. Um, you may not know that actually 90% of all volcanic eruptions actually take place underwater. Right? It's pretty amazing. Think of all the volcanic eruptions you've heard of, right? So Mount St. Helens. For every one Mount St. Helens, there's nine that occur underwater. Uh, moreover, the ocean actually holds the world's longest mountain range. It's about 40,000 miles in length to the mid-ocean ridge system. That's long enough to wrap around the Earth one and a half times, right? And despite all of this, we've literally seen more of the moon, the surface of the moon, than the ocean floor. And the reason is that any one of us with a telescope, a simple telescope or our naked eyes, can look up and literally see the surface of the moon because we can see through air, we can see through space, and the moon has no atmosphere. But water is opaque. Nobody can drive out on a boat or sail out on a, a boat and look down into the ocean, excuse me, look down into the ocean and see a mile below. Right? And so we just, we really, it, it, it's, it's Earth's longest, largest mystery. Now, um, the deep sea in particular uh, is, is a, a, for me, very exciting. That's deep ocean below which, below about half a mile, right? So you go half a mile below the sea, the sea level, and it's all the ocean uh, that, that uh, from there to the seafloor, right? And this ocean um, is uh, in a state of permanent darkness. Uh, the temperatures are always, are always near freezing, uh, and some of the deepest uh, places on Earth's crust are harbored in the ocean. So, for example, as you see here, the Mariana Trench, right? Uh, is the deepest, deepest place on Earth. And if you were to take Mount Everest and put it in the Marianas Trench, you'd still have two miles of water sitting atop of it. What is really striking is that at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the pressure is about eight tons per square inch. Eight tons per square inch. Eight ton, that's, uh, what is that, 16,000 PSI, right? So, um, the, uh, uh, think of the pressure in your car tire, right? I mean, you put in maybe 40 pounds per square inch, and now you're talking eight tons per square inch. If I were to take any one of you in this audience, count the total number of square inches on your body, uh, and, and use, use that, and I'd, it's about the equivalent of you bearing the weight of 50 jumbo jets, okay? So it's this, it's this environment that's really different from what we're used to living in, right? But despite these extreme, uh, seemingly extreme challenges, it's the largest habitat on Earth, right? Well, how large is it? Well, most of us are, are used to looking at a map like this, and this shows us, you know, the Earth and the continents and the ocean, uh, and uh, when we look at this, it's easy to think that, well, you know, land and the, 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 the amount of um, habitable place, the biosphere on land, is probably just as much as that in the ocean. Well, the deep ocean alone, I'm not even counting the surface water, everything that's a half a mile or deeper in perpetual darkness and near freezing temperatures is 80% of all the habitable places on Earth. 80% of our biosphere is deep ocean. Every ecosystem you can think of, uh, polar, uh, polar ice caps with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, um, polar bears, uh, the Serengeti, desert ecosystems, mountain ecosystems, the rainforest, all of that falls into 20%. Okay? And the deep ocean is the other 80%. So if I were to take this map and use it to represent the volume of biosphere, it would really look more like this. Right? That's how sort of modest all our terrestrial ecosystems are in terms of their volume. Right? So imagine you lived in a house and you only lived in 20% of it. So you lived in your bathroom and you never looked outside the door. And it would be really easy to think, well, God, there's monsters outside. Who knows? I heard something, you know? What was that ticking, right? And it isn't until you actually can see and understand the full extent of your home that you realize the role that each part of your home plays in making a habitable environment. You've got a water heater somewhere, probably. You've got some kind of heating and cooling or fans or whatever it is. And it's, it's through the understanding of your home that you really get the environment in which you live in on a daily basis. This is the challenge that I believe we 
have in terms of understanding the ocean, to best understand the role that it plays in governing our biosphere. Okay. So humankind's first real peak into the deep sea came in 1872 with, the, with the, uh, the start of the HMS Challenger expedition. This was the first true oceanographic expedition. And uh, scientists went out uh, for about four years. They sailed around the world and they, they uh, collected samples using nets and dredges uh, and brought them to the surface. And we learned about many, many new creatures. Uh, for example, this photo on the side here is of a deep sea sponge that has glass as a skeleton. The photos uh, on the right there are of some very beautiful uh, and very important microorganisms, these little things we call protists, that live in our ocean and play a huge role in governing a lot of those biogeochemical processes or the processes that keep our ocean clean and keep our planet running. Now, but humankind has never been satisfied with nets, and they've always wanted to go down and see it firsthand, even though some of their early attempts were, in my opinion, questionable, the fellow in the barrel. <laughs> So these are technologies from the 17th and 18th centuries wherein humankind was really trying to find ways to get to the seafloor, right? And, um, but I think it underscores the, the, the draw of the sea and the desire to go see it firsthand. Well, if we jump ahead to um, uh, 19, the 1930s, uh, uh, two fellows, William Beebe and Otis Barton, built a bathysphere. And this was humankind's first peek into the darkness with their own two eyes. The bathysphere was a big steel ball. It had an entryway, an entry port that was 12 inches in diameter. So, and these guys would squeeze through it. And they'd be lowered down there with a, a, a compressed bottle of oxygen that they would use to kind of bleed some oxygen in so they could breathe it. And their only way of communicating with the surface was through a telephone wire. So they were lowered down into the depths, and they saw with their own eyes some of, the, uh, some of the, the, the most exquisite animals. There were no cameras that were sensitive enough to capture uh, the, the, the pictures of these images in the darkness. So uh, Bibi uh, and Barton reported these to an artist who drew up a lot of the creatures that they saw, like this, the, like this anglerfish you see on the right-hand side. All right. If we jump ahead to today, uh, our ocean is... is um, almost teeming with many of these vehicles that we're using to understand and explore our ocean for the first time. We have advanced human-occupied submarines like the, the Alvin, which is in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, this is coming online as we speak. Uh, it is a U.S.-owned submarine that will allow American investigators to explore the deep with their own eyes as never before. There are many robotic submarines that we call remotely operated vehicles, or ROVs, uh, which you can see in the upper right-hand side, that are robots that we send full ocean depth all the way down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench again. And those robots are very capable, and they allow us to explore the ocean for extended durations. Uh, there are systems, observatories, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in the next slide, which allow us to have a permanent presence on the seafloor. And now, just like you've all heard about these aerial drones, we've had underwater drones for a while that sail around uh, and ex explore our oceans. Okay, so what I can tell you is uh, that uh, more recently, we've, we've had this advance in ocean observing technologies. And those are technologies that allow us to place instruments on the seafloor uh, and uh, um, they uh, enable us to be sort of have a permanent presence in the ocean. And equally important is it gives each of you in the audience here a chance to participate in uh, deep sea research. I'll come back to that later on. If we could play the video on this, um, our exploration of the deep sea uh, has led to the discovery of some amazing organisms. And what you see here uh, is a vampire squid. This is an organism that we've known about for many years, but only recently have we begun to understand its ecology. This is a, a rat tail, a very common deep sea fish with big eyes, not because it's looking at um, uh, sunlight, but because it's looking at the bioluminescence produced by other organisms. A transparent amphipod. This is like an insect that's totally clear, except for a few little things in its bodies, right? Some amazingly active shrimp that crawl around on the seafloor and scavenge any food that falls down. This crazy fish that has green eyes looking up. The two things on the front are his nose, right? Um, the, uh, uh, we find all sorts of, of, of mysteries in the deep fish we've never uh, seen before. Uh, and it goes just beyond fish. It includes un, uh, seeing these invertebrates that are a major part of the ocean. Things that are squids uh, and, and, and their relatives and, and um, uh, anemones and the like. Like this is a, a called a glass squid, a totally transparent squid again, except for its eyes and parts of its brain. And this fish, which has like infrared night vision, so we can see and capture fish in the darkness. So next, uh, uh, and so even in the last few years, we've discovered um, some amazing entirely new ecosystems. In the late 1970s, 
we discovered ecosystems we never thought of. These are ecosystems that um, aren't directly dependent on sunlight, but live off of chemical energy. So a group of geologists went down in the late 70s to look for um, evidence of um, uh, uh, plate tectonics, which we were just beginning to believe. It took that long for us to be convinced this was true. And they discovered entirely new um, ecosystems. They found areas on the seafloor where hot water was jetting out of the crust. Uh, and uh, next to all of that hot water lived animals, the likes of which we'd never seen before. Uh, what was most amazing is this, uh, they, they looked at this environment and they said, wow, look at all this black smoke. Well, it's not smoke, it's superheated water. And that, black is not, that blackness are particles that are coming out, okay? This environment, the water coming out of there is 350 degrees Celsius uh, at, at, uh, at its you know, typically highest. Um, those are temperatures like your oven in self-clean mode. Right? And living around these, this hot water, not in the hot water, but in the warm water that surrounds it, were animal communities the likes of which we've never seen before, like these giant tube worms. This is a worm that has no mouth, no gut, no digestive tract, no anus. Instead, it grows microbes deep inside its body and it feeds them chemicals, and those microbes in turn feed the worm. And the chemicals that it feeds them come from those hot venting features. Okay. Even more important is that we've discovered an entirely new community of microbes that live in the deep sea. And those microbes run our planet. And there are so many of them. There's 10 to the 28th. 10 to the 28th microbes that are about a microbe each. And if you put them end on end, you would stretch out light years into space. About 200 light years, in fact. Uh, believe me, do the math yourself. So there are that many microbes. They run our planet, and we don't know what nearly any of them are doing. All right, so we need to understand what these microbes are doing to better understand our own home. And so the ocean isn't just some strange little place on Earth. It is a part of your home, and it helps run your planet, right, and run your environment. Uh, they moderate temperatures. They produce half the oxygen on Earth. Uh, and they play a tremendous role in feeding marine organisms, of course, but also feeding us. Now, you all have a unique opportunity here to play a part in this because in recent years, scientists are developing tools to enable you all as, as, as um, citizen scientists to join us in exploring the ocean. So these are the names of a few different organizations that you can all uh, 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 look into, uh, and many of them have opportunities for you to be engaged either via telepresence through the comfort of your own home, on your computer, or even in person. And so with that, I would like to thank you for your time.